your attention. I'm not going to do a ton today, but just a few. I just want to remind you that we are we have started youth back up. They meet on Wednesday nights at seven in the youth building. Uh, Matt, or sorry, not Matt. I I am helping. It's funny is is Freudian slip, I guess. But I was youth pastor for 14 years, so. But Andrew is leading the youth right now. He is doing a wonderful job, and you don't want to miss what is going on back there in the youth building every Wednesday at seven, as well as our connect as our yeah. As well as our connect groups on Wednesday nights, we are having a uh, we're having a Bible study time for the men and the women, and we're going through the book of Mark. I believe Mark chapter five is next. Is that correct? Okay, Mark five is next week, and then in two Wednesdays, not the Wednesday, but the Wednesday after that, we're having our our monthly encounter night. You don't want to miss that night. It's going to be a wonderful night. It's not this Wednesday, but the next Wednesday. Well, we come and we just meet with God, and it's a wonderful time of worship and prayer, and and it's just encouragement. Um, I I look forward to each. It was supposed to be next week, but uh, your pastor is going to be out of town, so I selfishly I moved it a week because I want to be there. I don't want to miss it. So, see, I get that. I have that privilege. You know, I can move things if I'm going to miss it. You guys can't. Sorry. So, um, but anyway. We got that going on. We get, so we got youth on Wednesday nights. We got our connect groups on Wednesday nights. We got kids on Wednesday night. If you have kids, bring those. Casey is doing a wonderful job with our kids on Wednesday night as well. And so uh, I say as well because Andrew and Casey are married, and they're each one taking youth, one taking kids, and doing a great job with that. Also, we're having our Easter egg hunt on Easter. is just three weeks away. And three Sundays, we're having Easter Sunday. So if you don't have your ham bot, now's the time to start looking for one and you get the best price, so uh, I don't know whatever you eat on Easter. So, and a regional women's conference is coming up. Please see the back sheet for that, or talk to Ellie, and she will fill you in with what is going on there. If you are a guest with us today, I want to say welcome. We're so happy you're with us today. If you did not receive your gift, we have one in the back for you, back in the information t- and the information table. See Tim, the friendly face that's in the back. He will hook you up. And uh, yeah, hey Tim. Sorry, uh, he will hook you up. He's got the ba- he's got access to those bags, and and he would love to say hi to you. But if you did not receive your bag, your gift bag, I want to let you know that it's there for you, and you don't want to miss out on that. So thank you for being with us. And go ahead and text welcome to seven six five three hundred thirty sixty one. If you're part of our church, text connect to the same number for more information about what we have going on. And uh, and so, yes, that is it for announcements. I'm trying to keep it quick. Uh, so I know you're not, you didn't come to church for announcements. So, but it's just one of those necessary evils that we need to know what's going on in our church. So, all right, let's go ahead and pray. And uh, in case you're wondering, if you if you if you're like I, I have offering I have tithe I need to give and they're not passing the plate what's going on we have a box in the back that is ready for you just go ahead and drop it in there and we'll take care of it from there and I just want to say thank you so much for being faithful to give whatever God's called you to give or giving your tithes Lord I pray Lord God that you will just move in this service move in this time move in this message Lord Lord I thank you for what you've placed on my heart. I thank you for how you challenged me this week, Lord God, as the, these last few weeks as I've been preparing this message, Lord, I pray, Lord God, that it'll encourage, encourage us and challenge us this morning as well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to John chapter 14. We're taking a break from our series through Mark. Uh, the Bible study is going to keep going through Mark, but we're taking a break on Sunday mornings from Mark for a little while. And we're going to start a new series this month that's called Jesus Is. Jesus Is. The title today is The Way, the Truth, the Life. And you're going to see why here in a minute as we read the scripture this morning. So if you have your Bible and you're at John 14, we're going to read 1 through 7. If you can go ahead and stand with me as we read the Word of God this morning, that would be great. It says in John 14, starting in verse 1, Do not let your hearts be troubled. 
You believe in God, believe also in me. This is Jesus talking. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know... We don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. You may be seated. Lord, I thank you so much. For this scripture, Lord, I thank you so much for this statement. Lord, I thank you that you made this declaration that you are the way, the truth, and the life. That no one comes to the Father except through you. Lord, I pray that you'll speak to us this morning. Use my words to challenge our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. What a powerful scripture. In this one phrase, in verse 6 alone, we see the major why we do what we do as believers. If you are a Christian in this house today, this is your why we do what we do. If you were here last week, we looked at how we sow seeds. We need to sow the seeds of the gospel in our world. That is our job. The week before that, we looked at how we need to learn to take a Sabbath rest, but But we also need, while we need to learn how to rest in God, we also need to learn how to work for God. We need to be doing both. We are called to sow seeds of the gospel to all the world. Why? Because He is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. This is why we follow Jesus and why we work at sowing those seeds in our lives. Why? Because Jesus is the great I am. Before we dive into all my points that I have this morning, I want to look at the first statement that he makes in this verse. He says, I am the way, the truth, the life. That little, those two little words, those three letters, are huge according to Scripture. That's a big statement. It may, it may, you may have missed it, but really, that's, that, the Jews at that time, the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they knew what he was saying when he said, I am. How do they know? Because it says this in Exodus 3, 13 through 14. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. This is Moses talking to God at the burning bush. And they asked me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. This was God's title. This was his name. I am. This is how he defined himself with the Israelites. They knew him as I am. So when Jesus said this, in the scripture we just read, or, or he says this in John 8, 54 through 59, it says, Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. They asked him, you are but 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham? It would be like if I said, I saw George Washington, but you're only 42 years old. How did you see George Washington? He's been dead a long time. He said, "I, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day, and he saw it and was glad. You're You're not 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? Very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. 
Jesus made it known multiple times that he considered himself God. And so we're faced with a dilemma. We're faced with a dilemma in our world. As Before we dive into the Scriptures, before we look at the truth of, of He is the way, the truth, and the life, we have to understand one thing. We have a dilemma that is well articulated by C.S. Lewis in, the, in his book, Mere Christianity. This is what he says. He says, I am trying here to prevent, to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often, often say about Christ. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher. They, they say, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't, don't accept his claim to be God. That is one thing we must not say. A man who is merely a human and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. There, I'm done. I'm preaching. C.S. Lewis said it perfectly. We have no choice but to receive either he's a lunatic or he's Lord. Another way that it was said by someone else that, that he's either a lunatic, a liar, or a Lord. He can't be telling the truth. He can't be, he can't be just some good human moral teacher because he said this statement. This one statement that we started our service out with this morning. In, in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, what we see here, as a human, we have no choice but to either accept what he says about himself or reject it. There is no middle ground. And he says the following three things about himself. The first thing he says is Jesus says that he is the way. Jesus made this declaration about himself multiple times. For example, while he was talking at the woman of the well in John 11, verse 25, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will, will live even though they die. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus made it clear that he is the only way to the Father. He is the only way to heaven. In John 10, 8 through 9, it says, All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. Before Jesus, there seemed to be a way to heaven, but it was a difficult way to find. Actually, it was impossible. No human being the beginning of the world until Jesus ever lived a perfect enough life to go to heaven. There was a way, but nobody could follow the way. Nobody could do everything that was necessary of them to be able to go to heaven, to be with God. So what does that mean? An awful lot of people did not go to heaven. We see in the book of Exodus, God showing the people the only way to be with Him. And that was through elaborate sacrifices and systems. I remember we, we've been reading through the Bible together as a church on, and, and on the Bible app. And I remember I, I, I cheat a little bit. I listen to it as I'm driving. And it's not really cheating, actually. I, I actually hear things I sometimes haven't read. Does that make any sense? And, and, and so I would hear, I was listening through the ways that they needed to sacrifice. And he even said, even if someone thinks that they messed up, they need to take a sheep or, or a pigeon or something. They have to sacrifice an animal. There has to be a blood sacrifice for them, for their sin, so they can be right before God. There is no way that people could keep up with the amount of sins that they had in their life. We see, so there's an elaborate system of sacrifices 
that they had to go through. Why? Because in Psalm 24, 3-4, it shows us that only the pure could go and be with God. It says, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in His holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. It clearly states that the only the pure can ascend the mountain of the Lord. And how would one become pure before Jesus? Through sacrifice. Through, through blood sacrifices. It was, it, was a, it, was, it was not a fun way to live. And no man or woman or child ever lived a perfect life. Before Jesus. Jesus makes no mistake or false claims. And for many people, it may seem like a cold and hard statement when he says that he is the only way to heaven. I've heard it argued. I've been around. I've, 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 I've done things. I've, I've worked in restaurants and other places where there weren't a bunch of believers working with me. I know what it's like. And I hear, I heard people say, it's just, I can't believe your, your religion would just have the gall to say that the only way to heaven is through Jesus. What about the Buddhists? What about the Muslims? What about all these other religions? What if I was just good enough? Well, I was like, you can try. It's impossible, but you can try to be good enough. He makes no false claims. And I know it seems hard or cold, but really this statement that I am the way is a hopeful statement. Really, it is. Imagine this. Uh, picture this, right? We're all living in a, in a big building, and we're all in a big building, and all of a sudden it's, it's on fire. And there is one path out of the building that you can go that will keep you safe, that you'll be safe, you'll be able to exit safely without being burned. And you're like, Come this way. I found the way out. This is the only way out. And, and people are like, how dare you? I want to jump off the roof. That's the way out of the building. Well, sure it is, but it'll hurt when you land, maybe kill you. Well, I want to go out through this window. Well, don't go that way because it's a wall of fire. And it, you just, you're, you're, you're like, oh, how about this other way? It looks bigger. Yes, but that's where the fire originated. You know, don't go that way. Here is the only way. Listen, people aren't going to yell at you and call you bigoted and hateful for saying, here's the way to safety. Yet people in our world today, they like to say that Christianity is a hate-filled or a cold or a heartless movement because we say this is the only way to heaven. But really, this is a hopeful way because before this, there was no good way at all to heaven. But Jesus made a way to heaven. And so we as believers, we need to take hope in this, and we need to be encouraged by this. We need to make sure that we don't hesitate to show people the way because we know that they need this way or else they spend eternity in hell. We love them too much to let them do that. Other ways may look good, but they would lead to death. And so after this statement, we see another statement that Jesus makes about himself that demands a response. You see, him saying he is the way demands a response from us. It's not, well, if you feel like it, I'm the way. No, I am the way. He also says that he is the truth. He not only makes a statement that he's the only way, but that he is the ultimate truth. What a profound statement, especially in our world today. When we hear stuff that, like, like that may be your truth, but that's not my truth. Listen, He is the only truth. We're not being mean about it. It's just, this is what it is. Actually, I think a Bible-thumping, angry, mean Christian is an oxymoron. Real Christians should not be mean, should not be angry, should not be making people feel like idiots. Why? Because we should be full of love for the people around us. Listen, if your idea of Christianity is, is, is just some mean, angry bunch of people that are hypocrites, listen, there is a bunch of hypocrites in our world. A lot of Christians are trying. They're, they're trying to be better. They're trying to cha live a changed life. 
but He is the only truth. And why did Jesus say this? Another way is say, to say this using the word reality. He is the reality of all of God's promises to us. Numbers 23, 19 says this, God is not human that He should lie. Not a human being that He should change His mind. Does He speak and then not act? Does He promise and not fulfill? Let's give a little context for this verse. This is the first where Balaam is, he is, he is being hired by this man to go speak curses over Israel because he was afraid of them. And he, every time he went to go do so, God said, no, no. And, and ba- Balak comes to him and says, Balaam, come on. He's like, listen, God's not like us, that he'll lie, that he'll change his mind. When he said something, he's going to do it. And really, Balak, if he would have gone in line and, and su- surrendered, I don't know what would have happened, but he was determined to destroy Israel. And God was determined to save them. We serve a God that does not deceive us. He does not lie. He is always honest and He is always truthful. Jesus is our source of intimate knowledge of the Father. His answers, His teaching and commands were right. No shadow of dishonesty, falsehood, or lying was in His life. He is the reality of all that God promised. Our response should be to believe in Him and put into practice what we are taught. What are some things that Jesus says about us that may not we may not necessarily believe? I want you to ask, I want to ask yourself I want you to ask yourself that question. Are there times in your life that God has said something about you that you won't really believe? Here's the thing: every promise in God's in, in the Holy Word in the Bible is true. We may we may think, well, that's true for Pastor Matt, but that's not true for me. That, that's a lie. That's a lie. God's not a liar. If He says it about you, He means it. If He says, I'm the only way to heaven, He means it. If He says, I'm the only truth, all my truth is right. Listen, at that time, there were many different factions in the Israelite, in Israel that were saying, no, we're the truth, no, we're the truth, no, we're the truth. And Jesus said, no, I am the truth. You may have all these extra rules you're trying to get to to put on people's backs, but really, I am the truth. I am the only way to heaven, and that is the truth. You may feel burdened and weighed down, but I am here to take that burden off of you and let you know that it's easy to get to heaven. Not only is He the only way out of the building, but He is the only one telling us the truth about the way out. And what awaits for us when we escape. Jesus is there at the door saying, come to me. Come to me. I am freedom. I am hope. I am life. I am joy. I am peace. Come to me. I am safety. And as believers, we need to believe what he is saying. Do you know why I keep encouraging us to sow seeds, to bring the gospel to our friends, to pray for our loved ones, that we brought their names here at the cross? Why do we do that? Because we believe that He is the only way to heaven. And we love our friends. We love our neighbors. And we need to believe what Jesus says about Himself. He's not a liar. He is the only way. And He is the truth that makes it clear, the way out clear to us. And He also is the life. Without His sacrifice, there is no real eternal life. If we want to truly live, we need Him in our life. Without His sacrifice, Without Him doing what we're going to celebrate, what we're going to recognize in a few weeks of hanging, allowing Himself to be hung on the cross, beaten and bruised and bloodied and tortured for you, for me, for our loved ones that don't know Jesus, for our backdoor neighbor who who we might have a rivalry with because they keep throwing their leaves into our lawn, I don't know. He loves them too. 
If Jesus didn't hang Himself on the cross and sacrifice Himself for us. Because remember, the the only way to live a perfect life is to have sacrifice after sacrifice. and, And no man could keep up with it. But Jesus became the last sacrifice for all mankind. If we truly live, if we want to truly live, we need Him in our life. It says this in Romans 13, 14. I've had a Bible study this week, and we're reading through Romans 13. And this verse stuck out to me, and I could not shake it. And I thought, God said, this is a, I want you to share this verse with your church. It says, rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. What does this verse mean? It means that we need to literally put on Jesus in our life. He will cover us. He will protect us. When God looks at us, He doesn't look at Matt Malik anymore. He looks at, that's Matt, but he's covered by my son. He can come to me. You're welcome. Imagine this. We live in Colts country, and I know not everybody here is a Colts fan. I'm not really, but, you know, it's all good. Imagine if I was going to the game, and Owner of the Colts said, okay, everybody that's wearing a Colts jacket can come on into some massive party, meet the team. You can meet Peyton Manning. He was going to come back for this thing. I know he went to the Broncos, but he's still one of us. And, and so we go there, and I, come, and I show up in a Bears coat or a, what's another enemy of the Colts? Um, a, pa- a Patriots jacket. I walk, I try to walk in. They say, nope, nope, you're not allowed. You're not wearing the Colts. If I were to take that off and put on a cold jacket, I'd be welcome in. And that's a, that's a really bad illustration of how we're getting to heaven. See, we need to put on Jesus and let it cover who we were. Our old self is gone. Our old self is dead. We need to leave it behind. He offers new life to you. And we need to clothe ourselves with Jesus. We need to put Him on daily and not think about how to gratify the desires of our flesh. I believe what, he, what Paul says in Ephesians 4.24. It says, put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. We are created to be like God. That is our new self. In tr- not, not to be God. We're not Mormons. We don't believe we can become little gods. But we can become like God. We can be covered in Jesus. When we accepted Jesus in our lives, we put on a new life. Our old selves are God, are gone. Our old selves are gone, and He has a new, clean, He has a new, clean, spotless robe that we can put over our old self. I can't help but think about the story of the prodigal son here. When he came home to his father. His father didn't insist that he wash and get clean. Instead, he threw his robe over him, put his ring on him, and said, you are my son. See, that's how it is when we put on Jesus over our old self. It'll cover up who we were. It'll make us new. And I believe as Christians, we need to remind ourselves, no matter how long we've been saved, we need to remind ourselves of this truth. And we need to rejoice in in our Father for making this possible for us. Remember what we read in Psalm 24. It says, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in His holy place? One who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. His life in us makes us pure. And once we accept His way out of the building, once we hear His voice and we follow Him, we say, that is the truth. He is telling us the truth. There's safety here. I need to get to there. I need to be safe. I need to be whole. At that point, He puts His clothing on us. He he covers us in in Himself. And He says, now go back and bring others to Me. But here's the beauty. His clothing is fireproof. It cannot be burned. It cannot be scorched. We cannot be harmed by the fire. Doesn't mean we can find another way out. No, we've got to still bring people to the way. 
of escape. But see, it is our job as Christians to bring people to Jesus, to bring them to the hope, to bring them to the way, the truth, the life. Not only in this life, and so he, he is, He's given us life, not only in this life, but in eternity to come. His life is real. His life is eternal. I am so looking forward. I'm not, I'm not anxious to get there, but I'm looking forward to heaven because I think I'm going to go back to my 30-year-old self when I was in the best shape of my life, and I think that's how I'm going to be for eternity, okay? I just Don't argue with me. If I have my choice, it's going to be that about that stage when I was skinnier and my knees weren't hurting and my back wasn't hurting and, and you know, <clears throat> before all the health, I don't have that many health issues, but you know what I mean. I, there's going to be no more health issues. There's going to be no more cancer. There's going to be no more heart defects. We're going to have real life in heaven. But we also need to remember that He is alive for us now while we're here on earth. We may live with our aches and our pains. But we have a new hope that no one in our earth has, no one in our world has, except for those who know Jesus. And so I want to, I read this scripture to you today, and I am preparing us for Easter. I want to say this, this scripture demands a response. This isn't some good little feel-good scripture that you can read and move on from. This is a scripture that demands a response. Jesus doesn't give any allowance for indecision or riding the fence in this scripture. You can't be half in and half out with this scripture. You're either all in or you're all out. We need to choose what we will do with what God has called us to do. It says in Ephesians 5, 18 through 14, sorry, 8 through 14. We're not reading backwards. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light consists of all in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, Wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Church, we need to wake up. Church, we need to wake up. We need to stop living in fear of how people will respond to the message. Yes, we got to do it in love. We don't be mean about it. But listen, if you know there's an only way and somebody is pulling away from that, away from you and insisting on going deeper into the fire and you love them enough, do you know what I would probably do if my son decided to run back into the flames? I would probably tackle him, throw him over my shoulder, and run out the right way. I'm like, well, I don't want to hurt your feelings. I'm doing it to love. Come on. Come on, son. This is the way. This is the way. Listen, you see there's light out there. There's hope out there. Do you feel the coolness of the air? You can feel it against the fire. Come this way. No, Dad. I'll... Listen, I, I will fight to get my son to go out that door. If that was a physical fire in my house, I don't know if I would knock him out, but I would get close to get him out that door. Stop fighting with me, son. This is the way. Church, listen. We need to be loving. We need to respond. We need to wake up. And we need to understand that the world around us is burning. There's only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus. This isn't a mean statement. This is a true statement. And if we are believers, we will see that this statement. We will realize that we have no choice but to let people close to us know that He is the only way to heaven. It's 
This statement by Jesus, it demands that we either believe it or not. And as believers, we believe it, or we should believe what he said, that he's the only way, truth, and life. And when we believe it, we need to do something about it. We need to follow his truth out of the building. Then we need to go back, clothe in his righteousness, and get others out. It says this in 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires, they will pass away. Whoever does the will of God lives forever. Listen, we're in the world, but we're not of this world. We need to get other people that are in this world to Jesus while we're here on this earth. So today, church, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, today the response is this. You need to do something with this scripture. I'm not trying to badger you. I'm not trying to say, beat you over the head and say, hey, you need a witness more or whatever. Listen. We have to let there be a fire in our spirit and our bellies rise up and say there is an emergency going on here. The alarm bells are ringing. We need to get people saved. Because He is the only way. He is the only truth. He is the only life. If you don't know Jesus today and you're in this room, this statement demands a response from you as well. You need to choose this day who you will serve god or this world and jesus is the only way to freedom to life to the truth i'm not trying to scare you into heaven but i remember when i was not a believer when i had walked away from god at one point in my life I knew that I was doing the wrong thing. I knew I was going the wrong way. And when I had an opportunity to come back, I came back. And I've never looked back. Today, He is calling to you, asking you to follow Him out of this burning building and into a new life with Him. One thing that kept dropping in my heart as I was reading this and preparing this today is that partial acceptance is rejection of what Jesus has done for you. You cannot partially accept what He's done for you. You cannot say, I will accept it in part. You have to accept it in whole. So here's what we're going to do today. We're going to take communion here in a moment. Okay, go ahead and come on up. Today, like I said, there are two responses. If you're a believer in this room, and listen, I'm not I'm not trying to guilt anybody or badger anybody. I'm just trying to tell you what Jesus said. If you're a believer in this room, but you have not been living, if you've been asleep, and not having a sense of urgency in your life. Maybe you're like, I'm good. I'm just enjoying life outside the burning building. I'm just coasting. Today, we need this, this message demand. Not, not, not my message. Not the words that I said. But the scripture that we read demands a response. What are you going to do with what this Scripture says. If you truly believe that He is the only way, He is the only truth, He is the only life, you need to respond in life. And also in the other response, and I want everybody to respond at the same time. Maybe you're not a believer in this room. Maybe you've never really given your life to Jesus. Some of you, you may have been coming to church for years, and you may have been playing the game, but you've never really truly accepted Jesus as the only way, the only truth, the only life. So I don't want to miss what he says at the end of that scripture.
says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so if you're in this room and you're not a believer, you've never given your life to Jesus. He's calling to you like he called, like the, like the, uh, like the prodigal son was being called home in a way. The Father's looking for you to come to Him and He's going to run up to you. He's going to wrap you in His arms. He's going to make you clean. But you just need to turn your back on this world. I'm not going to say, say this prayer and you're all good. I'm going to say, listen, you use your own words to tell Jesus about all the... to say, God, I'm a, I'm a sinner. I bet you the son in the prodigal son story, he tried to tell his dad everything he did wrong. And his dad says, I don't care. You're home. I don't care. You're mine. You came back. You need to start telling Jesus and just say, God, I, I messed up so many ways. And he's going I'm sorry, I want to be your son. I want to live for you again. I want to live for you. I want to give my life to you. One of these two things we need to respond to today. So church, this is what I want to do. Kay's going to, she's going to, I don't know what she's going to play. She's going to play something. She's going to continue playing. And I'm going to open up the altars today. We got the wooden altars, we got the steps. And if you need to respond to this message today, to this scripture today, you need to come up here and get things right with God. There's going to be no judging of those who come to the altar. I believe we all need to come in some aspect. But I want it to be your choice. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something that they used to do at the revival in Brownsville a long time ago. I'm going to count to three. And on three, go ahead and come on up to the altar and meet with Jesus. He's here to meet with you. He's here to do a new thing in your life. Whether you've, already, either you've been a believer for 50 or 70 years or you're not a believer yet, He's here to meet with you. One. Let's go ahead and everybody go ahead and stand. Two. Three. Come to the altar. Let's respond to what God is calling us to respond to. Respond the way God's called us to respond. Don't ignore his tugging. Don't ignore his drawing you. Don't ignore him this morning. Respond. We need to respond to what Jesus is saying to us this morning. Or a lot of fire in our belly. If you don't know Jesus this morning, respond. Come to the altar. Now is the time. Now is the time. else. Not going to rush this. Anybody else? may not know why, but you know you need to get up to the altar. I want you to just go ahead and respond. We need to be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. And if He's tugging at our hearts, if He's tugging at our souls, we need to respond today.
but I respond. Lord, help me, Lord God, to follow you with more of a sense of urgency than I ever have before. Lord, we don't know when you're coming back. We don't know the day or the hour, but, but Lord, we also know that life is fleeting. So, Lord, we want to, I want to respond today, Lord God. Help me have more of an, uh, of an urgency to do what you've called me to do. Anybody else? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You are good, Lord. You're a loving Father. Lord, thank you for what you're doing right now in this room. Thank you for what you're doing right now at these altars. Lord, thank you for the freedom that is being experienced right now, Lord God. Lord, thank you, Lord God. Thank you for the fires being stirred up in our hearts and in our spirits, Lord God. Help us to obey what you're saying to us today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. And you're, you're welcome to stay at the altars if you need to. We're going to transition to communion this morning. If you don't have a cup and you're towards the front, there's some in this in this plate. If you're towards the back, there's some in the back. Today we're going to close with communion. If you have your cups, go ahead and Peel off the bottom, get the wafer out. It says this in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. What are they talking about? They're talking about Jesus. He, he, he sacrificed himself for us. He allowed his body to be broken for us. And so we remember this once a month in communion. That's when we do it here at First Assembly. Others do it different ways. So Lord, we thank you for your body that was broken for us. We thank you that you allowed your body to be beaten and broken and bloodied and bruised and pierced for us. Take and eat. Go ahead and peel off the uh, top part for the juice. It says this in verse 25. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Thank you, Lord, that your blood flowed for us. That you allowed your blood to be spilled to cover and wash all our sins away. We thank you for that, Lord. Take. And drink. <clears throat> For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In the name of Jesus Christ, I bless you today with the promises of God, which are yea and amen. The Holy Spirit will make you healthy and strong in your bodies, minds, and spirits to move in faith and expectancy. God's angels will be with you to protect you and keep you. Be blessed with supernatural strength to turn your eyes from foolish, worthless, and evil things 
Instead, you will behold the beauty of things that God has planned for you as you obey His Word. God will give you success and prosperity in your businesses and places of labor as you acknowledge and obey the imperative of Scripture concerning the tithe. God will give you spiritual strength to overcome the evil one and avoid temptation. God's grace will be upon you to fulfill your dreams and visions. Goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your long life. The Lord will bless you and keep you. The Lord will make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord will lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. I bless you today, church, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Have a wonderful week. If you see someone you've never met before, say hi and make yourself um, known to them. Love you guys.